I just thought, okay, I'm making six figures a month net. I need to go ahead and spend this because I'm saving a lot of it. But what's the point in having like millions of dollars saved up at my deathbed without actually getting to that, the time and the energy to spend the money, right? Tell me about your experience in Spain, Spain, your assistant. So this was actually crazy because, you know, I wanted to go ahead and, and spend some time where, where I, I could effectively blow my money. I wanted to go ahead and blow my money because every single month I was netting over six figures and I was like, okay, I'm saving a lot, but I need to go ahead and create like some type of epic story, right? So I thought, what better way than to get a presidential suite in Madrid, spend $1,500 to $2,000 a night, invite all of my boys that were in Madrid, and every single day we would just have this environment where we would go ahead and just create content, right? So every single day we were creating content, we were creating ads, we were creating VSLs, we were creating podcasts, and just thinking like, how cool would it be if I could essentially use this as a test to go ahead and spend a lot of money on things that I generally wouldn't spend money on, but do it in a way where I could go ahead and gain some type of experience, gain some type of knowledge, gain something about myself, where then I could get paid to live like this epic lifestyle. So, I mean, that's literally what I did. I went to Madrid and I was like, oh man, I don't want to go ahead and spend $2,000 a night on a presidential suite. Never spent $2,000 a night on a presidential suite before. But when I did it and we were just all together and we had this like good group of people where we could go ahead and do business together, there was like this, this collective energy that I, I realized that we should just be doing this at least multiple times a week, right? To be around good people that make a lot of money together and to constantly get and level up. That, that's the re main reason why I went to Madrid. I just wanted to test to see if it would work and it ended up did. Mm -hmm. And so how much do you think you spent over the course of the trip and how long was the trip? Probably 12 to 15 grand. Over how long? Uh, it's for, uh, like five days. Five days. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and how much do you think this will make you in like for the investment that you put in? So when I first spent money on it, I, don't, I didn't think that it would essentially make me any money. I just thought, okay, I'm making six figures a month net. I need to go ahead and spend this because I'm saving a lot of it. But what's the point in having like millions of dollars saved up at my deathbed without actually getting to that, the time and the energy to spend the money, right? Mm -hmm. So this was strategically in the beginning to just blow the money just to reward myself because every single day for the past 30 days, I've been making 30 to 60 pieces of content. So just imagine this, right? Every single day I wake up, I, I just throw water in my face. I drink some water out of a glass because plastic is poison. And I literally come here and just make 30 to 60 pieces of content every single morning. Now, doing that every single day and living a good life here and having a good dating life and having a good social circle life, that's good. But I knew I needed to go ahead and reward myself to literally make me kind of my own guinea pig and use operant conditioning to make me do certain things better. So if I'm using this 30 to 60 pieces of content every single day as a pain, running towards something would be some type of pleasure of blowing 12 to 15 grand on me and my friends to go somewhere and create content and to do a bunch of memories, right? So initially when I went to Madrid, it was more so just to reward myself for 30 to 60 days of just pure monk mode of literally going ahead and making content every single day to destroy all of the algorithms and just rank for everything. Mm -hmm. But then when I went to Madrid, I was like, whoa, I could literally spend 12 to 15 grand. I could have a lot of fun. I could create this amazing experience. I could go on a roller coaster ride. I could go ahead and do like indoor skydiving with like cool people. But then I could actually turn this into a money making experience. And that was like the biggest thing. I was like, whoa, the reward of me working really hard and being consistent with content could essentially be another thing that could level me up into another like level of content. And I was just like, okay, well, if I'm gonna reward myself, go to a new place, get a nice uh, presidential suite and just have cool people to go ahead and communicate with. What if I just use the connections and the, the catching up with my friends to then literally use that as a launching pad to make more content and make money? Mm -hmm. It's like one step back for three steps forward, isn't yep. it? Mm -hmm. That's insane. So what is the next way you're going to spend money and how does this tie back into the assistant? Okay, so the assistant... So I've learned really big lessons here on how to effectively reward myself in a way where it will give me more experiences and make me more money. And the second one is understanding what happens when you create a relationship, not to go ahead and create some new reality together, but for you to create such a strong reality for yourself where the other person comes into your reality. 
because what you realize is when you have relationships with people, it's kind of like this thing where you have to pretend to be someone else so that they like you and they pretend to be someone else so that you like them. And then you start this relationship together. It could be a intimate relationship with a lover. It could be someone with a business partner. And then after time, you start showing your real faces because you can't wear a mask forever. And you realize that you don't like the person that they really are. And they don't like the person that you really are. And then you just wasted a bunch of time. So I wanted to do this little test, right? I, I, I was like seeing this person and I wanted to see how we would go out and do it. Now here, it didn't really make sense because we would just go out to the same clubs, same nightlife, same restaurants. So it was, it was my entire reality fighting with her entire reality, right? And we were just going head to head to head to head and neither one of us wanted to go ahead and for example, change to the other person's reality. Now, the thing was very different when, when, you know, we started traveling with this person and this could be a lover, this could be a business partner, this could be whatever, is with my time, money, and energy, I created such a fun reality where people would literally have to go into my frame. Now, this was the biggest thing because it doesn't matter who you're dealing with. It could be some girl that's very, very bratty. It could be with some person that you want to do business with but doesn't necessarily respect you or see the value in you. If I created a situation where literally they go ahead and meet me where I live. So I'm staying at a suite. I'm spending $1,500 to $2,000 a month. They're able to go ahead and order room service. And I'm not doing any of this at the kindness of my heart. I'm literally doing this on my mission to make money, to go ahead and record podcasts, to do business. Then people realize that actually, I'm not doing all of these things or creating this reality to give you something just so that I could take from you. I didn't care if I brought somebody and I didn't sleep with them. I didn't care if, you know, I invited someone to do business and they didn't want to do deals with me because of the, the, the setup that I created, they would have missed out on doing X, Y, and Z with me, either business or going on an adventure because my reality was so strong. And one of the biggest things that I learned is when you go out and create a reality where it's so addicting, where it's so fun, where it's, you're literally taking people through adventures through time and space and you become the person that doesn't need anything because you have options, you have money, you have time, you have energy, you have relationships you start realizing that people will actually bend their realities to go ahead and be in your reality because your reality is just the better story. Mm -hmm. Like if I, if you have two people that are two storytellers and it's the exact same movie, the person with the ultimate story that could craft the same story out of the exact same resources of time, money, and energy, of course, why not go into that reality? Cause it's just like so much better. Like if, if I'm with one other person and the other person can create a better reality with their resources, I would happily be able to give up what I'm doing, what I think, and certain things that I'm doing right now to just sacrifice them to literally do what that person's doing. And I've realized it's the exact same thing the other way around. I think the problem with most people is they don't want to go ahead and create that reality. They don't want to go ahead and make money. They don't want to go ahead and improve themselves. They'd rather go ahead and leech from other people. And I'm starting to realize that the biggest hack to life is literally just making a bunch of money, not just so that you can save it and invest it and wait for later, but to use it to create setups where it's more beneficial to you. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you curate your environment to give you the best results, essentially. So how did so how does this relate back to the assistant? Did this assistant okay. come to... Like, it, so I feel I'm, glad, like I'm glad she's not here. <laughs> I feel like you're like so, working around the question, so, so I'm curious. So, so here's the thing, okay? I was dating her. I was dating her and to be fair, she was very, very bratty. Very, very, very bratty. Like I, I was seeing her and I was like, okay, like I don't really have time for girls that are of the bratty like persona because of the fact that I just don't have time for that, right? Mm -hmm. Like bratty girls are fun at times, but being bratty is also kind of like uh, seeking some type of validation or attention or something. And I just, I, I don't like bratty girls. I'd rather prefer mm -hmm. more feminine and like submissive women, right? Yep. But the craziest thing ended up happening, man. Like before I would go ahead and can you go ahead and get me a cup of water or make me some tea? And she'd be like, no. Or I'd be like, oh, can you go ahead and, you know, like I, I'd be focused on business and work and I'd be like, oh, can you go ahead and, you know, for example, make a call for something and just like help me out. And she's like, no. And bro, like I brought her to Spain and I was like, okay, we are no longer in a romantic role, I genuinely need you to go ahead and help me because I don't want to deal with the cameras. I don't want to go ahead and deal with any one of these things. I, I literally need you to help me, right? I'm going to focus on my business. I'm going to be with my boys. And it was just an experiment, right? Mm -hmm. So literally, I, I just 
like I just messaged her. I was like, hey, you want to go ahead and go to Madrid? And she was just like, oh, wow, this is so random. I was like, send me your passport details. I'm like, boom. Okay, got the got her a ticket. And I was like, damn, this might work really amazing or not so, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, like immediately a week later, we meet up in an Uber and we're going to the airport. And I'm like, this could literally end up super amazing or a complete disaster. Because again, before everything about her was just like bratty. She was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And she was always like keeping some type of resistance when I wanted to do something, right? But the funniest thing happened the moment that we got there. I didn't tell her anything. I didn't tell her who we were going to meet. I just said, hey, you understand cameras. I need help. You're going to go and help me. This isn't me rewarding you with anything. Like I genuinely am bringing you because you have some type of value to help me so I could focus on the podcast and the business, right? And I brought her there and it was just epic, man, because I remember going there. Uh, we went in like really crappy, basically like Ryanair flights. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything about it like seemed really cheap. I was just like only bring one backpack because like I don't want to go pay for extra luggage, Right. So I'm like carrying this backpack filled with all of my things. And I only had like two or three pairs of underwear. That's why I basically wear every the same thing every single day. <laughs> and the moment we got there, I will never forget her face. Right. Because we got the cards. She didn't hear what type of room that I got. We went up the elevator and then in the elevator in this five star hotel, you would see just these doors. Right. So one door, one door, one door, one door. And then we went up to our hotel and it was the one with like the two big doors. And like, I already knew in her face, she was like, what is going on? He didn't say anything about it. I got the bad seats on the plane. I, I didn't get the extra baggage, right? And the moment we walked in and I was like, oh, I got to go and film some stories. And you know, you could film some stories too. help me out. Was the moment that like, I saw the, the entire dynamics in her face change. And she literally just became the sweetest, most helpful person in the world. And, and actually became like a really, really good assistant, right? Like we got there. And like already it was just like there was a bed on the far corner and I had the room and, you know, we just kind of like divided and I was like, hey, I'll sleep there. You sleep there. And then she looked around. She was like, what the heck? Because it was like a thousand meters squared or a thousand feet. It was huge, Wait, bro. What? It was huge. How big is this? This I, is like 700. I, I don't know, because in when, when I was looking at it, when I got it, I don't know if it was in feet or meters, but it was big. right? It was it was it's probably it was probably bigger than my apartment. Wow. Right. So I literally go in and it's a hotel, right? So it was like a major flex in a five-star hotel. And she goes in there and she, like, I knew she was like impressed. And dude, I was pretty impressed. I was like, damn, this is freaking good. Right. And I was the one that spent money on it. Right. And so I bring her there and I'm like setting everything up. And I understood that, okay, I need to really show just how valuable my time is. Like, I don't think the people that were in my life that I was dating understood how cool I am. Right. And it's the exact same thing with anyone in life. Like no one really understands how cool you are. And you can't tell them or brag how you cool, cool you are. The best way is to subtly flex by you not even realizing how cool you are, but focusing on a business to make money, right? So bam, we landed. And I just told her, I was like, okay, uh, this guy and this guy are coming at this time and this time. We're going to go ahead and do a podcast. And literally we arrived there. Like she looked around. I was already busy doing notes, sending voice memos, looking even busier than I was. That's why I was sending you a lot of voice memos too. Cause I was like, okay, I got to go ahead and appear busy. Cause I was, and like we, we had a podcast at five and another one at seven. It was just bam, work, 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 work. Mm -hmm. And it was crazy, bro. She was like setting up the cameras. She was like getting like my guests water. She was like helping out. I was like, oh, I want to go ahead and do something. I want to go ahead and do something fun. She's like, okay, I'll book it. The next day she like planned all these things where I was able to go ahead and see like these roller coasters at Warner Brothers Studios. I was like, what? This is crazy. Uh, the next day we went skydive, indoor skydiving. And she was literally organizing all of these things, checking in my flights, checking me out of flights, organizing things like willing to pack for me, willing to go ahead and support my um, guests, as well as like just being very, very nice and just a very, very supportive person. And I was like, this person that I've been trying to date for weeks, if not months, that was always giving me some pushback for some reason now, She's very, very, very nice. Mm -hmm. And it just like blew my mind. So then we just started talking and getting closer. And then I was just kind of telling her the secrets. I was like, listen, you want to go ahead and essentially attract a guy like me, right? Because all the guys that you've dated aren't like me. It's obvious because you're unhappy and you're like in your mid twenties and you know, you need to go ahead and find someone, but mm -hmm. they're not out there because there's not a lot of people like me and my friends, right? And she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how would I do it? And let's do some rundown. If I ever ask you, have you been to Dubai and you have been to Dubai? What do you say? And she was like, oh, I don't know. You say no. 
You have never been to Dubai. <laughs> and she was like, well, what do you mean? Well, well, guys like me, after seeing a bunch of crazy things and have been through the world and have experienced an eclectic life, we, what we really crave for is, is some type of innocence because our life is already filled with a lot of danger and craziness, right? So I was really into the big red flags when I was younger, dating all of these women that were not good for me, but it was just a really good fun time. But as my life became more stressful in business and life and more challenging, the thing that I like coming home to was just a nice, innocent, kind woman that's very feminine. And she started understanding that. And it was just freaking crazy, man. Like when we were flying back home and we were just doing a little review, so many things already happened. She was like, oh, you know, like you inspired me to eat healthier because you were just like, like while she was literally listening while I was doing all these podcasts, right? So imagine like, someone that I'm like interested in just like listening overhearing mm. about all of the things in my beliefs and like already it was just like she knew what to do and what not to do without me actually ever communicating logically on why this is a good or bad thing mm -hmm. like she was like yeah you know I think I need to eat more meat and like I, I think I <laughs> eat too much bread she was like I, I think I'm done vaping I want to focus on my health and I'm like what like I'm literally thinking why don't people more do this and I realized the reason why most men can't do this is they spend their entire 20s chasing women and having nothing to show for it in their 30s and 40s and 50s because chasing women is just a black hole. When instead what they should have done is literally focusing on a way to make as much amount of money with as little amount of time as possible because then they could essentially do cool things like this, right? Mm -hmm. So when do you feel like you peaked or have you even hit your peak in terms of dating at 28? Dude, I don't think my dating is nowhere close. Like I have friends that are way better in charisma, way better in understanding the dynamics with women. And even to date, like I, I learned so much from the people around me. One of the biggest things that I like spending the time around are people that are actually better at dating than me and better at women than me because I understand that that is actually the thing that I need to improve the most. I wouldn't say that I peaked yet. I think that I've still yet begun. I think I'm really good at finding the women that I'm really attracted to and getting them into my life. But it's also another thing in learning how to retain them and keep them and literally to have them be a certain way that is actually beneficial for my life instead of me just giving a bunch of value, time and money and energy and experiences without actually getting anything in return. Mm -hmm. Because a relationship with a woman is like a relationship with anything else. It's like a relationship with a business partner. There needs to be some type of way where they're investing in each other. I'll invest time, money and energy. Now, even though the people that I'm dating might not necessarily have the money as me, I do expect a same level of time and energy to be invested back in me. And it's one of the biggest things that, I, that I'm learning right now because, I mean, I just got out of a three-year relationship in Bali where I literally lost my frames, lost my boundaries, lost all of those things, didn't know how to communicate. And even now, I'm just like learning exactly how. Like, for example, yesterday, I was on a date. I was on a double date, right? I was literally on a double date yesterday. And it was me and one of my brothers and uh, the girl that he's dating and the girl that I brought, right? And in my mind, I thought, that my girl was a sweetheart, she wouldn't do anything wrong ever, uh, or so I thought, right? And this is someone that I, I've been seeing non-seriously, but it was just like, okay, let me go ahead and bring her around to just like the people that, that I see because it's like, it's good to bring them into my life instead of the other way around. Now they start speaking Russian, right? Now, one thing that this girl doesn't understand is I can understand a good amount of Russian. Yapani mayu yagavru poruski, right? It means I understand and I speak Russian. Mm -hmm. And I noticed she said some things that crossed the boundary. She essentially, like it was someone that I brought onto a trip with actually like us, right? And she talked bad about the trip and, you know, my friends. And she didn't understand that I actually understood what she said, right? So literally at that point, it crossed the boundary. In the past, I had no idea exactly how to put my boundary down of saying, okay, this is acceptable or unacceptable. I would essentially pretend that she didn't disrespect me in the past just so that I would keep this relationship because in the past I was in the scarcity thinking. Mm -hmm. But now because I'm surrounded by people that are so good and so charismatic with the people that they go ahead and, and talk to, like literally the people that we hang out, I literally told them and asked them their advice because what people don't understand is you don't need to know everything. Right? If, I, if I'm really bad at like making money or dating or fitness, I'm going to go ahead and, ahead and ask my friends that are better than me. And I literally sent them the, the reason. I was like, yo, this is what they said. Uh, it was disrespectful. I sent her home and this is just it. How do I go ahead and react? And they literally told me exactly how to set the right boundaries and frames and how to enforce those boundaries and, and frames. Because every single time you do not do something 
or you do something just so somebody else likes you a little and you allow them to disrespect you a little bit just so that they like you a little bit, you end up liking yourself less. And I knew this was a problem in my past relationships. So now knowing it now and being surrounded by really, really strong people, they literally told me, yo, this is exactly what you do. This is pure disrespect. They need to go ahead and understand where the line is because most relationships, they, they don't know where the line is. So normally what happens it's the man's fault that normally becomes weak and doesn't hold the frame and doesn't set the right boundaries. And it's also the reason why the woman ends up losing attraction for the man. And like I said, I don't think my dating life is peak. I think it's just begun. And I'm only just so grateful because I'm surrounding myself around people that literally have certain characteristics and qualities that I want in myself that I spend time with so that I can almost kind of take that into my soul and my characteristics in terms of my own development and character building. Mm -hmm. So if, you ha if you're in a relationship or dating a girl and she crosses a boundary, what have you learned from being around these people is, as being the best course of action for setting the, where the boundaries are? The biggest thing is just kind of like levels. There's levels to things, right? Now, when, when someone first crosses a boundary, right, the, the most important thing is, of course, letting them know right away to create that feedback loop. The worst thing that you could ever do when someone has crossed your boundary is keeping it inside and not saying anything for days, weeks, months, or years. Because naturally what happens if, you, if someone crosses your boundary and you don't actually express it or let them know or create a feedback loop where they know that they've wronged you, it will start building up resentment inside of you where then you're gonna start passive aggressively like saying smarky remarks, remarks, which is just immature and unprofessional. The best way to go ahead and do it is pull them aside and let them know that they've crossed your boundary, right? Now with a woman and a man, it's completely different. With men, you can literally just pull them aside and be like, hey man, you did X, Y, and Z yesterday. Maybe do it the following day so you're not like emotionally charged. Uh, when you go ahead and do that, you're literally disrespecting my time and my money and my energy. And like, if you continue doing that, we, we can't spend time together. Mm -hmm. Like for example, one of the big boundaries that I have is with time, right? So it's like, even with you, I said one, but then like I needed 10 minutes. So I gave you like a heads up way before we actually needed to meet. So I have the standards of people that I do business with, with time. Yep. Right. Time. Yep. So I'm like, yo, if I tell you three and you show up at three 30 and you don't give me a heads up earlier on, you're essentially disrespecting my time. Mm. Especially like, for example, if I go ahead and book a hotel for a hundred, 500, a thousand, $2,000 a night, every single minute that you waste and not go and show up on this podcast on time, you were literally disrespecting my time and the money that I spent to go out and have this conversation with you, right? And with the woman, it's the exact same thing. You know, before, if a woman disrespected me, I would find passive aggressive ways in the past to go out and let them know. I would maybe do a smarky remark. I would bring something up weeks later and it would just build up and build up and build up and build up when back then it's just because I didn't know how to communicate it. When now some woman goes ahead and crosses a boundary, I immediately let them know. I say, hey, you could continue to go ahead and do that but I don't date girls that go ahead and do that. Now, this person doesn't have to change. That's fine. But if she doesn't change, she loses me. Now, one thing that I realize is I can't change anybody. If someone crosses my boundary, that is their decision, not mine. But what I can control is how I react to it. And how I can react to it is either giving this person more of my time and energy or taking it away. And the more you start living this life and start respecting your boundaries and understanding what you want out of people and what you don't want out of people, people literally start respecting you. This is literally the biggest thing that I've, I've learned and realized. The reason why people don't respect you is because you don't know how to respect yourself and you're spending all of your time trying to get, you know, this girl or this guy to like you. And what you should be doing is defining, well, what is it do I want this person to behave like? Because I know what I like and what I don't like about myself. I can look in the mirror and be like, oh, I like this, I like this, I like this, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that. If I'm so hard and harsh on myself, why am I not like that with my friends? Why am I not like that with my family? If I allow people into my life and I say, okay, what are the behaviors that I accept out of them that will help me grow as a person? And what are the behaviors that are bad for me? Every single time you notice one little red flag, one little negative behavior, that's when you literally need to go ahead and let them know your boundary. Be like, hey, you do this. I don't do business with people that do that. I don't date people that go ahead and do that. And at that point, it's up to their choice to understand, okay, well, is, are, are, you, actually worth, are you actually worth changing? And then if they don't, you start realizing that either number one, this person was never meant to be in your life or two, you need to grow as a person so that people literally have no other choice but to get into your reality because with your reality, you could provide such an epic life of adventure and fun and romance and money and, and just spontaneousness. 
And that's why, like, at the end of the day, you can't change anybody else, man. The only person that you could change if people aren't giving you what you deserve is you have to become the person that actually deserves it by growing as a person, making more money, becoming more charismatic, building your network, traveling, getting more experiences, getting more stories, become more of an interesting person. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And so did you find that when this girl that you brought as your assistant, she was being snarky, bratty, what was that caused by? Was that caused by a resentment from bad experiences with past like relationships and stuff and then it was she was placing the precedence of how like the past relationships went on you yeah and then it was basically you breaking those past experiences and showing that you're actually above that and beyond that yeah and then you were like showing her how she could actually be acting and, and broke down the barriers basically yep. is that correct yeah so the main the main challenge that that women have especially so every single woman in their mid-20s will face this challenge and that is they've been burnt by so many guys that were all talk and no action that they now have these trust issues and every single time some guy that could potentially be a good guy shows up in front of them they do not know exactly how to act because they just pair this good guy with everybody else that has failed them miserably and many of the women in their mid-20s and 30s and 40s they understand this and necessarily it's not necessarily their fault it's because all of the guys that they've talked to were actually at fault it's because they were weak they would speak high game but they would have nothing to follow up on and maybe that's what she thought about me maybe she saw someone that was dressed nice that was suited up that was taking in all these fancy restaurants that thought okay maybe this person might not necessarily be a long-term thing because last time that i experienced something like this i got my heart broken uh, he didn't follow up what he said. He wasn't a man of his word. And because of that, now it's harder for me to open up. Mm -hmm. Now, every single time a good guy could potentially be in front of this girl in their mid-20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, they cannot see it because they've been burnt by so many guys in the past. Now, what changed was instead of me trying to talk and explain my way, oh, I'm a high-value man, this is my life, I make a bunch of money, I travel around the world, I literally needed her for a specific role for me to go ahead and make more money in my business. Right. So it was at the point where I literally took away all of the romantic chasing that I had in the past. And I was like, okay, at this point, I literally just need to fly you out because I need help with the setup. I don't know cameras. I don't know any of these things. Plus, you're a pretty girl. So you could increase my status when I go ahead and, you know, flex on these guys that I'm doing business with. Right. Which again, this was all an experiment. And it was just something that happened where I didn't expect anything from her. I didn't expect any transaction of, oh, I bought you a drink, so now you have to kiss me. But instead, I literally just gave so much value without expecting anything in return. And she saw the life of abundance that I had. She saw that I was a leader amongst men. She saw people were looking up to me. She saw that people are asking for advice. And she was literally just almost like a fly on the wall of the life that I was already living. And then she realized, whoa, this guy is actually exactly who he says he is. And that's one of the biggest things that I'm learning is it's like when I go ahead and spend more time with you and the people that we spend a lot of time with, the people that are up leveling in life, dating and business is just easy because instead of me trying to explain to people, these are my values, this is what I want in life, these are what I'm willing to stand for, what I'm not willing to stand for, these are my boundaries, right? Instead of actually expressing it, it's like you don't have to communicate anymore because now people are coming into your world. People see how you do business with each other. If they spend less time with us, it's because we realize they're not like us. They don't have the same values as us. And people start learning very, very fast how to exactly act around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's everyone, like relationships, friends and everything. Yeah, that's very interesting. And so what, have, you, have you hanged out with her since you've been back? Has this frame, this, this shift continued on ever since? Like have you met since you came back from Spain or...? Mm -hmm. Which number one is Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's very good um do you think that the way that she reacted at first in the shift do you think that was 
just a older lady or like a tw- mid twenties or do you think mid twenties is old lady? for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't mean old. Like, do you think like you you said it was like a, a common thing amongst women who are like twenty five or something? Do you think it's also could be a cultural thing? Like, if you're dating a Ukrainian or maybe a Belarusian or something versus some girl from America, do you think it's definitely a cultural? Yeah, thing? Yeah, I think I think it's not only cultures, but it's also the the amount of people in a city, right? Because the thing about dating, people don't realize that that as women age, especially like women in their like if, if you're if you want to go out and date women in their mid twenties, what you need to understand is this: depending on what city and culture they're coming from, the culture could be completely different, right? If they're in the West and they've been experienced with America and they listen to all of like the negative garbage of the music of all of these people, like programming them to just think very, very bad, bad thoughts to ruin like the conservative nature of, you know, the innocence of like, for example, women, right? That's completely different than, for example, someone in Eastern Europe or Asia, right? And then you even get even more granular and you compare someone that is in a big city population of one, two, three million compared to like a little village. And more so, the more stimulus and the more opportunity for guys to come in and attempt to go in and date a woman, the more likely the woman will have bad experiences, especially because most men are weak and most men have no idea exactly how to treat a good girl, right? Most men will literally find a beautiful, amazing, good girl. And most men will be the reason why most of these beautiful, amazing, good girls would be ruined because most men, they're not men of value. They don't actually do what it is that they say. And what I found, especially with different cultures, is if men are weak and have no idea how to date, women have no other option but to become strong. If women are literally going out to the clubs and the bars in whatever big major city in the world and all they're doing is getting harassed by men who have no idea how to talk, they're completely drunk, they literally go ahead and say, hey, baby girl, you want to go out and dance? And they're just grinding up on them without actually asking for permission or actually, you know, being charismatic, but instead just being at the bar and you'll see the guys just get on the top as if they're just some fruit fly, right? Like some fruit fly flying on a fruit. It's just the weirdest, (laughs) weirdest thing. Many of these women will become jaded because most men are just weak, right? And with the big cities, with the Western culture moving over, the more influence they have on that, the more likely they got jaded just because they have no opportunity but to become stronger and become more masculine just because most most men in the West are just becoming weak. Mm -hmm. And I feel like even if you date richer men or more successful men, that doesn't even fix the problem. Like most of the guys in these big cities who have money, they're doing the bottle service in the clubs. They're just as weak as the fucking brokey dude who talks to the girls in the club, like on the dance floor. It's, it seems like it's just a common reoccurring theme regardless of what level you're dating at. It seems like the, the amount, amount of success or the amount of money you have doesn't even, doesn't even affect, like doesn't even fix that situation. 100%. Okay, so you said there was a, two stories. There was the assistant story and I think there was something else that you were talking about. There was something else that I think you mentioned. Oh, just 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 the fuck what was it? It was it was assistant story and just learning exactly how to effectively blow my money. Right. So so that's one thing. So one of the things that that I'm gonna do in Prague is kind of like the exact same thing, right? So every single day when I'm here, when I have this base, it's it's very good because I can wake up, create my content. I could go ahead and, for example, have a very normal dating life, just meet a bunch of really cool people here, as well as like just build the connection with like my brothers that live here and, and where we travel around the world with, as well as like going and training, fighting and boxing and all those things, right? But what I'm realizing is how I want my setup to be is I want that for the most of the part to stay the same, maybe once or twice uh, a month. I would want to go ahead and visit some parts of Europe where there's other people like me and you that are there to just do business with, right? To maybe take someone that I'm dating, introduce them to whoever there it is that they're dating. And for me to essentially go to these places in an act of actually doing business to create podcasts so that imagine every single time you meet up with your friends, I just bring and pack me with these two cameras and they have some lights and we can set up some tripods and we can essentially get paid to just catch up with the things that we've learned and the lessons that are allowing us to grow to the next level, right? Mm-hmm. So I essentially wanted to go ahead and create a life where how can I create it where it's so fun and so addicting that people would FOMO and not want to miss out for the women that I'm dating and the men that I want to do business with. So essentially how it is, I'm going to do it again, like in Prague, which is like two weeks uh, from now, a week and a half from now, from when I was in Madrid, right? And essentially just do the exact same thing. Find a hotel, book the- Get the penthouse. Get the baddest, sickest place. That's the most expensive thing. Find the local G's and people that I could do business with there together. Set up some cameras, like interview each other and, and actually find a way to get closer. Because one thing that I realized with these podcasts is I had friends- 
I was friends with some of these people that I podcast with, but when I interviewed them and they interviewed me, I generally found and learned more things about them that I didn't know before. Mm. And you, the things probably would never come up. No, yeah. no, no. Just ne- never would have come up. I remember when I was like interviewing one of the guys, right? It was like Damien and Paul. Like afterwards, I was like, dude, I didn't know that about you. And I, I generally felt like more love and gratitude in my heart for this other person. Mm-hmm. The next thing is just, you know, maybe once every six months, you go ahead and spend 30 to 60 days in Bali just because it's cool, right? Just to, to have a base in Europe, to have a base in Asia and just bounce back and forth and just ultimately just living that life, right? Where essentially I could gain some stability here of just having the same routine every single day. I could clearly be in monk boat here every single day. Then once or twice a week, I go to some city in some other part of Europe to go ahead and do business and create content with people there that I could go ahead and collaborate with as well as bringing the people in my life that have added a lot of value to me. So either business people, uh, people that work with me or people that I'm dating and just like live a really crazy life where I don't think about money for, for five days. Mm -hmm. And that, that was literally what I did at this Madrid event. It was like, I got everyone room service. I was always ordering everyone dinner. Like the bills were just like crazy. I got each, like, I literally got like the behind the scenes, uh, club life table in like Halloween, which is like the most epic part of like Spain. Right. And we literally got like the behind the DJ booth and everything was like epic and crazy. Uh, If we wanted to go ahead and indoor skydiving, we went there. If we wanted to go ahead and even just see, you know, like an amusement park that most people would save a lot of money for to just go for an entire day. I was just like, let's just go for an hour or two because I had another podcast. And we just went there. We ran around, got on as many like Superman uh, roller coasters as possible and just came back home just because why not? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like to have just five days where you just don't think about money and just spend and spend and spend to literally give to the people that are close to you did something weird to my brain. It it literally taught me what it's like to be fully abundant where I didn't think about money at all. I was just constantly spending. And now I came back with all of this energy and I was like, so inspired. I was like, I messaged was Daniel, we got to go ahead and do more podcasts. We need to go ahead and create more content because there's something that clicked in my mind when I had those five days to literally just blow as much money as possible without thinking. And it gave me (laughs) so much more fire when I came back here and I was like, man, we got to go ahead and make more money so that the next time we do that, it's even more on a high level. We create better content. We bring cooler people with each other and we even make more money from that experience. We gain all these stories and life lessons and experiences to just create content on, mm. which then we can make money, which is like the self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you repeat that when you go ahead and go to Bali with some friends for a month or two, because now you have a different part of the world. And now people are constantly seeing you and your friends traveling around the world, living the best version of your life and getting FOMO and realizing that it's either they change and they grow as well to meet our standards or they just watch us have fun and they miss out, mm. which ultimately is like best for them because then they want to grow. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest things I find to staying motivated is to give yourself a taste of the next level so that you can actually see what it's like and then bring yourself back to where you were before because you don't understand what you are missing until it's gone. And so if you've never experienced the next level, you'll never know what you're missing. Because right now, if you're broke, you every day there's another version of you who is already a millionaire, and you're not experiencing that because you haven't you haven't built that business you should have built. You haven't made that. You haven't invested in crypto or whatever it is, right? But you don't really understand that because you've never experienced it. Like in an alternate universe, you are a millionaire already, but you can't conceptualize it because it, you can't see it. But if you give yourself a taste of what it would be like to live that millionaire lifestyle for just like a weekend or something, you will then understand, fuck, this could be me. I could be doing this every day, not just two days of a year. And that is how you'll give yourself the motivation to keep going. So like when guys hit like 100K a month, a million a month, how, you ask yourself like, how do I stay motivated? Well, the key is there's someone making 10 mil a month who has their own fucking private jet. And the guy who makes 10 mil a month knows a billionaire who has an entire island that he owns. And so if you just give yourself a taste of the next level every single time you level up, you'll always be endlessly motivated to keep going for more. Because dudes hit 10K a month and they think they've hit the peak. They just haven't met a guy making 100K a month. It's just continual stepping stones to the next level. Mm. And so I think as well, um, like if you're like, maybe a broke guy's watching this and going like, oh, but I don't want to spend money. I got no money to spend. That's stupid. You don't have to actually spend too much money. It's just giving yourself a taste of whatever the next level is. So maybe the next level might be a networking event that costs you $500 and you meet a guy who runs a successful business who is two years younger than you and you're like, fuck, like this guy is not actually smarter than me, but he's making all this money from business. Why can't I do this? It could be something as simple as that. So 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why every single person, what they need to do is they need to look at their friend group and they need to ask themselves, what is this person actually bringing to my life? Are they bringing more time? Are they bringing more money? Are they bringing more energy? Do they have qualities that I actually want to go ahead and embody or do they have qualities that are making me weaker as a person? And I think every single person should have some type of social circle audit. Right. Uh, does this person, does he bring me energy or does he take energy? Does he inspire me to go ahead and make more money or to grow as a person? Or does he constantly play the victim game and constantly blame other people on why he doesn't have those things? And it's just one thing to go ahead and do because you literally become the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. The problem with most people is most of their friends are broke. Most of their friends aren't charismatic. Most of their friends aren't doing anything cool in their life. So how can you go ahead and taste this crazier life that you've never even experienced if you're spending time with people that are losers that are bringing you down? And the thing about this is the biggest loser is probably you because you know that they're bad for you and you spend more time doing things to spend more time with them. I mean, I had this biggest problem. I remember I would have friends that I would want to pull up, pull up, pull up with me because I'm like, oh, we went to childhood together. Oh, we played baseball together. And I would literally, literally give them courses, tell them exactly what I was doing, show them the life that I was living. But for some reason, they were never as motivated. And I started realizing that the only way that you could do to go ahead and inspire those people is to literally FOMO them out into not wanting to miss out 100%. into literally growing. Yeah, 100%. So what I had to do, there's literally friends that I loved that I had to say goodbye to. My parents, I loved them to death, but I had to say goodbye to them for one to two years to literally become the best version of myself. I had to replace all of the people that I was becoming the average of because I was literally becoming the average of my mom, my dad, and my friends, which none of them were happy. So of course, how would be happy if I became the average of five people who were unhappy? And I started replacing with people that were happy that we're making more money. Mm -hmm. That's why I think the best investment that I ever had was a one-way trip to Asia because even though I did not know who I would meet or where would I go or what I would do, it was far better than staying around the people that weren't doing anything. And that's when I tasted exactly what you were talking about. I was like, okay, how do I get to the next level? I have to taste it. I was living as a homeless backpacker, living in hostels for like $5 a day, like, like going ahead and running after the German sixes when <laughs> I met some guy who's making millions who had his big villa, who created a setup where life just was for him instead of him chasing it. And I was like, oh, that's a different life. But I would have never met him if I was stuck to my friends and my family. Mm -hmm. I literally had to cut the line from them for one to two years, become friends with all these millionaires by just being a genuinely cool guy that had stories of like my hostel days, right? And then grow to that person and then I could go back to my family and my friends and then get back, but only from a place of power instead of a place of, let me convince you that I'm going to become successful before it actually happens. Mm, mm. You said that the only way that you can basically get to the next level is to, the only way to motivate a friend is basically to not even try to motivate them. It has to be like indirect motivation. So when I got into crypto in like 2018, I tried to tell my friends to get into it. Like, this is the future of money. This like the way the, the Fed's going with all this money printing, it's going to be like where you make a lot of money. You, got, you should invest. None of them listen, not a single person. And so crypto went to shit. I lost money for like two whole years, but I just kept going at it. And then the bull run happened. And in the middle of the bull run, when I was making all this money from all the time I put in because I was you know, looking into the future, they v only then started listening. Oh man, you, you still doing that crypto thing? Like, oh, I've, I've seen it's been going up lately. Is now a good time to buy? And when they started buying, it was at the top. And then they didn't even fucking make any money. And they only listen... People only listen to results. They only listen if you're actually doing something with your life. So I had friends who didn't want to do anything entrepreneurial, didn't want to do anything besides a 9 to 5. And they started seeing me like travel to Europe and just doing cool things. And they would then start asking me like, man, like how, like, how did you achieve that? How do I like... Fuck, like how did this guy who I knew who I thought I was better than, he's now going on to do better things than me and he's traveling all through Europe while I'm working at McDonald's as a manager. And it was only through that pain of seeing someone that they once knew as being at their level go way beyond them that actually pissed them off and realized like, fuck, this dude was an idiot. How is he making more money than me? He was a moron. And now he's making all this money. He was, he was he forgetful. Like, how is he doing all this stuff? And then they'll capit they basically capitulate and then they start asking you questions. They, they drop their ego like, man... Like, how did you do this? What should I do? I make, I make a little bit of money, McDonald's manager. Like, how do I start doing, you know, going to the next level? And only then can you actually motivate your friends to do things. So for, for me, it was that friend asking about how he should get to the next level. He was a McDonald's manager. I told him, look, you should quit your job. 
and you should maybe move to an, you should move out of home, quit your job, go to a new city and get a sales gig and also try to start an online business. And so he did that. He literally did everything. He stopped his McDonald's manager job. He moved to a new city, which was the city I lived in. He didn't get a sales job, but he, um, he got some other sort of job. And he built an online business and he just closed a seven-figure client where he's basically going to be managing their um, like email marketing stuff. And that'll be making him tons of money, way more than he got from McDonald's managing. And he's going to be traveling the world soon. And that's the only way you can motivate someone. It's basically you have to accept that they don't want to listen to you because why would someone listen to you if you're broke? Like if you are with your broke friend and you were both broke and you're trying to tell him this is how we're going to get rich, why would he listen to you? It hasn't worked. You've failed to make it work. Oh, I've been doing copywriting for two months, man. Come join me. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do good. You haven't even fucking made a dollar. Why would he listen to you? People listen to results. They listen to lifestyle. This is why lifestyle brands do really well because lifestyle brands sell to someone on a, such a deep level that like, it just triggers their, triggers their emotions. If you, t- if you try to inspire someone through, man, it's going to work, <laughs> man, like this is the future, they don't, they don't fucking listen. You have to sell through results. You have to go out there and you have to actually change your life and become the person who is worth listening to because like, you would never take advice from a broke person on how to get rich. So why would your friend... And why would your friend listen to you when you're both broke? It just wouldn't happen. He will only listen to you if you actually get results, which makes sense. I think the main reason why most, I think the main reason why people stay broke and never actually make money is because they never get actually pissed off in their situation enough. And they never actually get angry. Like for example, the the person that you talked about, he finally got angry enough about his situation where he went and succeeded. I remember there was this point where like, for example, I had these students of mine that came in in my course, right? And they were just getting started and they were looking up at me and they're like, oh my God, like you do all these things, right? And I remember that I thought that I could always stay above them and they will always stay beneath me, right? But it could also work the other way around. I remember I got lazy. I remember I got complacent. I remember I was making a certain level of income where literally I was just stagnant, right? But little did I know that in life you're either growing or dying. And even though in that moment it was stagnant, what I didn't realize is I was slowly going through a slow demise that essentially made me lose everything, right? And around this time where I lost everything, I remember seeing the students that initially came in now doing millions of dollars a month. Now imagine this, right? Here was I making seven figures a year teaching these people how to make money. And then I got lazy. And then these people started making millions and millions of dollars per month. And at that point, I had like two different feelings. Number one, I was like, oh, I can't do this. And I started feeling negative. And I started feeling like how my friends probably did when I started succeeding. And I I literally felt it. When I saw the people that were beneath me now making more than me, and now I'm beneath them, there was this thing in my brain where it was like, oh, maybe it's too late for me. Maybe like all of these excuses, all these limiting beliefs, the same way how when I grew, my friends probably thought the exact same thing and I was angry at them for not growing and being like, no, you could do this too. But I started realizing it's the exact same thing in any aspect of life. If you're up or down, if you're beneath people or above people in terms of just the game of life. And that is you need to get pissed off. The fact that there are people that had less than you that are now making more than you with less than what you have right now should literally piss you off. And I remember I had this decision to make. It's number one. I play the victim of, oh, they now make more money than me. And I am a static creature. I can't move. I'm like a tree where I can't get up and go somewhere. I'm literally stuck at this place, this income, this relationship, this job, this income bracket, this house. I can't move and accept the fact that this is the cards that I was played with. Or I could get so pissed off that someone else was able to figure out that I could also figure it out too. And that's literally what I ended up doing. I literally got so pissed off at my situation and so angry that even though I had negative voices inside my head, I was so angry to the point where my anger was so loud that I couldn't even hear all of the negative voices. And I literally forced myself to succeed. I think the most reason why most people, most of our friends that we have to motivate uh, to become successful is they have those two options as well. And they either decide to get better or bitter. And most of the times they choose to be bitter. They're like, oh, well, that person had success or he had that person or he knew that thing or he was lucky when they fail to realize that the reason why they suck at life is because they're not angry enough. And two, they're playing a victim. No one's going to save you. Like no one's going to help you. No one's going to give you a bunch of money, give you an online business. No one's going to do that for you. No one's going to do that for me. And the only way that I got out of it was I got so freaking pissed off in my situation that there were literally people that had the life that I wanted and I was complaining that I literally had to stop complaining and start taking action. Mm-hmm. 
Most people are actually they they most people say they're pissed off, but they're actually like pretty comfortable. Like p- most people, they'll message they like people message me and they'll go like, "Man, like I'm pissed off. I have this shit job. Like, how do I like, how do I like get the motivation to build a business?" And I'm like, "You would be motivated if you were pissed off. You can't say you hate your job and you're annoyed at your job and then tell me you're unmotivated because clearly you're comfortable enough." to not be motivated to try to fix your situation. Like, that's just, it's just fucking stupid. How can you both, in t- how can you in the same universe be pissed off that you don't like your job and you hate it and you want change, but then feel unmotivated? Like, motivation will come when you get pissed off. Maybe you need to actually work more hours at your shit job. Maybe you need to get a worse job. Maybe you need to spend, maybe you need to make your life even worse so that it's more painful so that you actually stop being a fucking lazy piece of shit and start actually putting the work in. Yeah, the problem with most of these people that need motivation to succeed is what they really need is a therapist. They're literally going ahead and having all this anger and instead of going ahead and channeling that anger into results, they literally use anger as like an emotional ejaculation, right? Where they essentially feel all these emotions, feel all these emotions. They they don't want to go ahead and do anything with it. And they don't know what to do anything with. So they want to go ahead and complain to someone of, oh man, I'm pissed off at my job. And I'm pissed off at, you know, like my work or my relationship. When most of the times, what you really crave for is a therapist to tell you, oh, it's okay that you feel those emotions. What you should be doing if you really wanted to succeed is taking all of that negative emotions and channeling it and fueling it in a way that actually serves you. For every single person that comes up to you or I, they're like, oh man, you know, my job sucks or my relationship sucks. What they're craving for is attention for you to be like, it's okay, buddy. Your life is okay. Everything will be fine. They're craving a mom and dad to go ahead and console them. What they need to go ahead and do is take responsibility to shut up and to literally work in silence until their results speak louder than their words. Yeah. And most people, they actually don't really want change. They just get they just get jealous of other people with things that other people have and they think they want change but they actually don't really want it like they actually are that like when you feel comfort comfort comes from living a life that you're just in your brain comfortable with like your brain you've got your girlfriend you've got your nine to five job you make enough money to survive everything's comfortable from a like evolutionary standpoint everything's going good like you don't necessarily need more that feeling that you might have of, oh, like I'm, I hate my situation, that might even just be brought on by people rubbing in their lifestyle that you might not even really want. So you have to make a decision like, do you actually genuinely want what comes with that next level? And just make a decision like yes or no. Because having this like middle ground of, oh, I'm pissed off, I want more, but I sort of don't actually really want it is not good. Either you decide you're going to stay average forever and that's what you're going to be or you make a decision that you genuinely want the next level and then you put in the work just make stop fucking around in the middle just make a decision which one are you going to be like that's what people need to do and so if you and so one of the big things back to dating when i was 20 so 2 years ago people would tell me oh man wait till you get to your peak at 30 you're going to get so many better women oh like like you peak men peak later than women women's peak is like 21 I would hear this and I would disagree. I would be like, that is the most retarded advice ever. That's not actually happening. Because I'd be in Australia, right? And I'd go to a club and I'm 20, right? At the time. And there would be older guys in the club and every single dude over 25 was fucking weird. Like if you're in Australia or maybe even America, but Australia, and you're over 25 in the club, you're weird. Like, what are you doing here? You should have a wife and kids. Like you should not be here. Or or it's some fucking 32-year-old dude who buys a table and he has bottle service and he's got a bunch of like club like club hoves chicks like hanging out at his table like taking the free drinks it would never make sense in my mind why you peak when you're older because all the older dudes would not be getting any of the hot chicks like in the clubs in australia the dude that did the best was the 19 year old surfer university kid that had zero, like 50 bucks in his bank account but he was just He just was fun to be around. That was the guy that did the best. He was like the top level of the club scene. It was never the dude that had the table that was successful. A guy could in Australia be successful, have money, be in shape, have a good network, be wise, and he could get a fucking... He he wouldn't even be good with girls, right? None of the ones that he would want that were like maybe 19, 20, 21. But then you come over here to Eastern Europe and it's like a totally different dynamic. Guys are like my friends here, like yourself, like 28 and other people older. And they're dating girls the same age as me who are like genuinely really beautiful and amazing women. And it's a totally different dynamic over here. So what would you say 
to like, did you notice the same thing coming from America to here? And also, if so, what would you say to someone who's like 20, 21 to understand this and conceptualize this idea? I think the biggest thing that men in their 20s and in their teenage years need to understand of men peaking in their 30s is the reason why is because of the time they actually invested in getting good at a specific skill. When you think about a man, you think about a character that needs to have a bunch of different skills. They need to learn how to fight. They need to go ahead and know how to make money. They need to learn how to network, how to, you know, really be charismatic and how to go ahead and date. Now, the thing about all of these, these are, these are all different levels of skills. Now, the problem with most men in their 20s and in their teenage years is they spend all of their time chasing women and not enough time chasing all of the other stats of their life. Now, women is kind of like the thing that you should chase for the last because of the fact that you need to go ahead and build who you are, not dependent on women first, right? So the reason why men peak later on is because they literally take the time in getting good at a first skill. So the first skill is like, how can I just make money where I'm not sacrificing my time for it? My entire life, I had no money. My parents had no money. So earlier on, I sacrificed my dating life just so that I could focus on my money, right? Uh, but then when I lost my health by chasing the money, I realized actually I need to also focus on my health. So then I started realizing actually I need to focus on my health first and get in the best shape of my life because if I can't treat my body right, I'm literally costing myself money by not being in the healthiest position possible. For every single time I spend money on a bad cheeseburger or like something that takes away from my health, I'm literally slowly killing myself and taking years of my life that could potentially be more money if I were to just swap it. So I started realizing actually if we were going to go ahead and do some skills, I had to go ahead and, for example, get really good at my fitness and get like a really strong mindset. Then I need to focus on learning exactly how I relate with people because how I'll make money is with relationable skills. If someone makes more money than me, I have to learn exactly how I can influence them to teach me, right? And then the money comes. And one of the things that I'm realizing once you kind of go through the basis of, you know, getting a good mindset, getting a good fitness, uh, then learning how to network with people that have more money than you so you can make more money and then ultimately making more money, you kind of go back and make it even stronger. So like as you go older, it's because the reason why you start peaking is you had multiple different iterations of going back at square one and starting off with the basics and getting it better. So in my second iteration, I was like, okay, let me go back to the fitness. I need to go ahead and learn jujitsu. D- did that for a year. And I realized the relationship with women was kind of like crap. So then I started spending all my time like learning exactly how to date even better. And then, you know, I was realized I need to go ahead and make more money. And the reason why people peak so late is because they focus on the wrong things earlier on. They major in minor things. When in fact, if you just knew that life is about kind of working on certain different aspects of your life, of your health, your mindset, your, 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 your ability to network and your, your charisma and the stories that you tell to women and your money making potential, you start realizing that actually you don't have to peak in your 30s. You know, there's people living lives that I'm kind of jealous of because they're doing what I'm doing in their 20s and it angers me. It angers me the fact that, dude, you're only like 22 years old. You know all these things that I know, but you have so much more time than I do to actually go ahead and make the Mm, right decisions instead of the wrong decisions as me. The biggest thing that I crave for is people's youth. And I think they say that the, the youth is wasted on the young and you get old when you're wise but now you have all this wisdom Mm. and you have no more time right so now we have this amazing thing where it's like dude we now now i'm approaching 30 man now i'm an old man right i'm a wise never pick that and an old man but people think i'm in my 20s because it's asian don't raisin right (laughs) and and the biggest thing that i'm now literally focusing on is while all of these people are like destroying their health i'm like fine okay because even though i might peak in my 30s it doesn't mean i'm going to stop If I continue my longevity practices, uh, my health, and continue looking like I'm 18 years old all the way up until I'm in my 40s, there's no no reason I could peak and then go down, especially if I surround myself with people like yourself and other people that constantly only want what's best for me and push me to the standards of life that they know I deserve. It's almost like like you as a man should literally go as high, as high, as high, as high, as high, as high, and then you die. There should never be no going down because you hold yourself accountable. You have the right social circle around you and you constantly push to become the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I find that in life, I've realized this now, there's like maybe six different sections that you need to like try to become really good in. And most people, it takes 30, 40, 50 years to figure out the truth of each section. So maybe one section is fitness. It might take someone several decades just to figure out the best way to do fitness. But when you think about it, it could take you, not decades, it could take you six months just to f- figure out the entire truth of everything around fitness. Like let's, let's think of date, uh, diet, for example. Some people are still vegans when they're 50 years old. Like some people 
they're going to have to get to 50, 60 and then realize, oh, fuck, veganism was not the right thing. And then they'll go to what is actually the perfect diet and it's something that revolves around what we would have eaten many, many centuries ago. And it's more like a high meat-based diet with fruits and a little bit of carbs and not cooking too much, but maybe cooking a little bit if you want to and just keeping it like a bit of a raw, simple, um, like sort of organic diet. Like that is the peak diet, but it takes people decades just to go through the education and mistakes to figure out that that's the best thing to do. And that's the same for all the areas, right? Fitness, money, dating. If someone might get to 60, get divorced and then realize, oh fuck, maybe I shouldn't have wifed up that chick that had a 50 body count from like America or something. She's Ma- different, I swear. Maybe I shouldn't, some dude will be like 35 buying bottle service in Miami and then he would start dating some chick from that he met in the club in Miami, and he'll go, and he'll, and then she'll fuck him over, and he'll go, oh man, maybe these Miami girls aren't it. Maybe I shouldn't date a chick from fucking America. And it's only then that they realize these things. So if you as a as a person can figure out the truth of these six, five, seven, whatever it is, main sectors of life as fast as possible you can get to the top incredibly quickly. So money, it's going to be about building businesses. It's going to be about learning skills, providing value. It's going to be about focusing your attention, not doing 10 different things at one time. It's going to be about networking, being around the right people, knowing that it's about opportunities that you find, that it's all, it's all about who you know, not what you know. Like if you understand all these principles at fucking 21, you'll be able to go way more successful than a guy that figures them out at 45. And that's, that's just the key to life. It's really like seven main areas, six main areas. You get to the top 1% in terms of your understanding of each category as fast as possible. And then you can get to the top incredibly fast. And the key to understanding everything as fast as possible is to invest into your education of that topic to get you the knowledge as fast as possible. So if you're trying to learn how to do the gym, you have two methods, right? You either go into the gym, watch YouTube videos and try to figure out how to push the weights. Or you hire a coach who clearly knows what he's doing and he basically teaches you what to do. The second path is going to get you to the top 1% of knowing how to use the gym. 100 times faster than trying to figure it, out yourself, figure it out yourself. And that's why if you get money early on, you can succeed in all the areas so fast. Because money will decrease the time required for you to get to the top 1% of all the other areas. So if you get money first or money second, maybe fitness first then you can get all the other areas super fucking quick because you can pay for the time of someone who has the exact knowledge that you need to get you to the top level as fast as possible. And that's why you've got the money, you're doing these experiences and stuff. You're allowing yourself to level up in the fastest time that you possibly can so you've got the biggest head start on everyone else. Yeah, that's literally exactly what I did. When I found a way to make $10,000 a month, all of that money just went and went back to literally how can I save myself more time, which will essentially make me more money. So when I had the $10,000, I was like, okay, how can I live off of a little bit of it and take that $10,000 and make more of it? So I started hiring a bunch of agencies to build my business. Then we started netting you know, six figures a month. So then I was like, okay, what are the weaknesses in my life that I need to focus on? Oh, I don't know. And networking with other high value men and as well as like dating, right? As well as like, those were kind of like the biggest things that I need to focus on. So what I ended up doing, literally the money that I made, I started investing it so that I could spend most of my time making money, but then I could pay for someone's 10 to 20 to 30 year experience so that I don't have to waste another 30 years to learn it. Right. Mm, That's why, for example, if if I was like really bad at dating, say I didn't know exactly how to find my dream girl. And you told me, oh, this guy's really good at finding a dream girl. He's been doing it for years. Well, how did he do it? Cool. How much? Twelve thousand dollars. People were amazed when I found out that you told me about this. And within like 30 seconds of you telling me about this, I've I sent twelve thousand dollars. My friend (laughs) was like, dude, give me the twelve grand. I was like, you do not have the results that I want. Why would I give you the money? Which is brutally honest, but it's true. Within seconds, I sent 12 grand to someone that I had no idea. I didn't see their social media. I didn't see their website. I just sent a bank transfer. And just like that, I downloaded his entire skill set where now his framework works really, really well for me. Mm -hmm. Now, what else ends up happening? Okay, well, uh, how do I go ahead and learn exactly how to build my relationship? Because it's one thing to attract someone into your life. It's another thing to build a relationship that grows through time. So I was like, okay, well, who are the people I know that are really good at that? How can I just invest as much money as possible with them? Traveling around the world with them, uh, paying for dinners, paying for steaks, paying for whatever, right? 
literally there's people that have the things that it is that you want. And the best thing is to literally have them as your friends. And one of the things that I like doing is it's with those six aspects of life that I need to focus on for my fitness, for my health, for my dating, for my personality. I like having at least one friend who is world-class at that than, than I am. Like for example, for you, you're really good at crypto and investing. You're world-class at it. So I literally go ahead and spend time with you. And I'm like, oh, you, you understand the markets. You understand a lot of the things and what they actually mean. I don't have to because I can now like borrow your years and years and years of experience. Another thing that I like doing at, and do this every single time I'm at the sauna, if, if someone old and wise comes in that has some type of results that I want, that maybe they had a lot of money in doing something, or maybe they have really good relationships, maybe they tried monogamy for their entire life, maybe they tried getting married, maybe they tried polygamy, maybe they tried a bunch of different dating styles, I want to ask them what they did 10 years in the future right? Once they've been doing it for 10 years and asking them, was it worth it? What was their biggest regret? Because if I know if it was worth it and if it was their biggest regret, then I could save another 10 to 20 years of my life. Like if I'm deciding, oh, I want to be vegan or carnivore, vegan or carnivore, great. Let me find someone who's been vegan or carnivore for, for 50 years of their life. So they invested 50 years of their life. And let me ask them, okay, what, what, like, what your, what your biggest regrets of vegans? Oh, you know, like, uh, I, I, I'm not able to go ahead and make love with my wife because I have no libido because I just, fuck, I'm just eating plants <laughs> or, or the carnivore. You know what? It's great. I feel like alive, but I'm only pooping once a month. Right. So it's like, mm. what are the regrets I want to know? So I can decide, do I want to waste the next 10, 20, 30 years of my life? Or do I know right away? Okay. Actually, I don't want to go ahead and do that because even though I could be happy right now, I could have some fake happiness it could essentially end up messing me up in the long term of things. And you want to look at the best way to determine who you should listen to is to look at the results of the person that like, like if you're picking between a few people, look at the average results of that particular person. So who look at the average fucking vegan. Do you want to look like that person? No, you do not want to look like the average vegan. You do not want to grow purple hair. Okay. Look at the average person who eats a high meat based organic diet. That person is going to be a lot more like you want to look like. Obviously, you don't want to look like... What's his name? The Liver King? Oh, yeah. Okay, maybe you don't want to look like Liver King, but there's another guy, Carnivore MD. That guy looks amazing. And if you want to look like him, he's a surfer, has all this energy. He's older, but he looks young. He's like fucking vascular. He's like as vascular as you. Maybe more than... I don't know. Maybe you're more than him, maybe. But like those... If you want to be like... If you want those results, you have to follow the process that they follow. So I would just never... I would just never be a vegan because that they, they just look fucking weird they got they just look weird i would never do it if i if i saw some vegan and the guy was insanely ripped and i could just tell that the vegan diet was responsible for his results maybe i'd start listening but i just haven't seen that yet so but i want to go back to the point about um the australia thing with the, the dudes over 25 struggling with dating why do you think it is that we're saying like focus on yourself level yourself up and you'll get the girls but that doesn't work in australia do you think there's something about Australian... I don't know if you've ever met Australian girls before. Do you think you could... Do you think you know why I've seen... That was like my experience in the clubs? Like, do you think you know why? What, what do you mean? Like, so... So like in, a, in Australia, right? We, what, what we're saying is when you get to your late 20s, that's when you're at your highest level and you'll be able to date the best level women. But in Australia, I see dudes over 25 and they're just... The, the, the dudes that are getting the most beautiful women are the younger guys, like just university dudes that surf and skate and have no money, but they're sort of cool. Like that's, that's like the top guy in Australia. If you're a, if you're a 30 year old businessman who's successful and travels the world, that doesn't necessarily get you an amazing woman in Australia. I'm just wondering why that is. Maybe it's because the values are off because many times the reason why people end up being with someone is because that is the highest chance for, I guess, their survival, right? Like for example, I think there was like some studies, don't quote me on this, but like for example, if I was in starvation and I was genuinely hungry and I was fathomed and I couldn't eat and I needed food, I would generally find a heavier woman more attractive because my biology would be like, oh, this heavier woman knows where the food is. So I find her attractive because if I could go <laughs> ahead and fornicate with her, then I could go ahead and eat food, right? So there are certain places where like, it's just not optimized to go ahead and, and pursue certain things. One of the things is, for example, in the West, right? Like with, with most men now becoming weak and weak and weak and weak and weak, women really have no value or women really have no incentive to stay with a man that's weak. 
So that's why a lot of women are literally divorcing their men because they literally aren't passionate about their men at all. And they're more focused on their career because they cannot depend on a man to be strong because most men are weak. Now, maybe in Australia, it's a little bit different. I'm not sure about the culture in Australia, but like, for example, if you have an abundant society that doesn't really care about resources, that doesn't really care about, you know, like traveling around the world or experiences, because I don't know, maybe in Australia, they already travel a lot. They already do. And yeah. what they crave for is just fun and a good time. Yeah. Then that's what they optimize for. The, the dating life optimizes for what will benefit them the most based off of their pain point. If you have a society where everyone's already traveling, where everyone already comes from money or knows someone with money, when everyone literally has all this opportunity in life and the thing that they lack for is just fun, then generally they're going to go ahead and optimize for the guy that is the most fun. Now, survival wise, it's probably not going to be the best thing for them. But in that moment in time, because they're not in a survival instinctual mode, all of the things that would naturally be craving for in a relationship for survival, like for example, resourcefulness, having a network, the ability to go ahead and overcome dangerous situations. None of that ends up mattering because they're never experiencing that. They live in the safe, cushy world. So at that point, many of the women are just bored. Like many of these women are bored. They have all this opportunity. They have their career. They make money. They travel around the world. So what they crave for is just, can I just find a really, 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 really good, fun guy? Yeah. Now in that it. moment, in that moment, it's good. But then you got to also like zoom out and ask, okay, well, 10 to 20 years, of that, how does it actually work? Is that woman, if that woman ends up going after that man in his in his in his early twenties, it's fun, right? They may look like they're having fun in that moment in time, but if you zoom out in a long enough time horizon and scale, 10 to 20 years, say that girl, right, chooses that guy that doesn't do anything, he doesn't have a business, he's getting all of the girls in his twenties, he's having a lot of fun. What does his long term game look like? Like what, what, like say a woman finds a guy like that, they get together. What are the relationship like after 10 years? What are the relationship like after 20 years? Mm. You can't, you can't look at that moment in time and that slice in time and say, this is exactly what will define this person's relationship for the rest of their life. Because it could look fun in that moment, but I can guarantee you in a long enough time horizon, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, that relationship probably would not work out. It would end up in heartbreak, it would end up with the woman yelling at the man because the man's not doing anything. It would end up in a broken family because now the kids would be born. Mom and dad are constantly fighting, right? Because like they have no money because the guy isn't doing anything. And on a long enough time horizon, even though that guy looks like a winner in that club, in that moment, in that time, he's actually the loser. It's the exact same thing for me. There was a point in my life where if you looked at my timeline compared to someone else's timeline, I looked like the winner, right? In 2015, I went from zero to 1.5 million in 12 months, right? And I netted about several six figures in profit, right? So in that timeline of that 12 months, it literally looked like I went like this. But in another timeline of someone else that started the same business in 2015, mm -hmm. they made zero dollars that entire year. Wow. So if you compared me to them, I was the winner. But if you zoom out in a long enough time horizon, five years, 10 years, right? That money that I made, I ended up losing. What people didn't see in that first year went from zero to one five million in 12 months and then zero the following year and zero the following year and zero the following year for that one business model because I didn't have a long enough time horizon scale of making my decisions. But that same business that focused on things like content and digital real estate, the first year they made zero dollars. The second year they were averaging like a dollar a month right? The third year, they started doing $3,000 to $5,000 to $10,000 a month. The fourth year, they started doing like $50,000, $80,000, $90,000 a month, most of it profit, and now scaling exponentially and compounding. Now, what people are judging in that moment is in that first year, it looks like I won. But if you zoom out in the five to 10 year picture, I completely lost and this person won, which is why if you just think in terms of the decisions you make in longer time horizons, you cannot lose because most people are competing in the short term. Most people want to be that guy, that fun guy at the bar in the club, getting all of the girls in their 20s. But what does that guy look like in his 30s? What does that guy look like in his 40s? I'd rather have a better setup with ease, making more money, having a really good dating pool. If I'm not getting any girls and I live in Australia, I could make money and move. Like what people don't understand is they're not a freaking tree. A tree is stuck to wherever it was born and raised in, wherever it was fertilized, wherever it was born. We are not trees. We can literally get up and leave. If you're in your 30s and 40s and you find you're successful, you're traveling around the world, and the women are going after the guy in their 20s instead of you, 
You could leave. You don't have to stay in Australia. You don't have to go back to Australia. You could go to Asia. You could go to Eastern European Europe. You could go to South America. You could literally go anywhere in the world and have a better success rate. And you don't have to compete with this 20-year-old guy because what this 20-year-old guy will find, because even though he might win the battle in the long enough time horizon, he will hate his life 10 years from now. Odds are he'd probably hate his life five years from now. The moment the alcohol builds up, the moment he gets with a girl that literally as time goes by, he becomes more weaker. She becomes more stronger. The fighting happens. The broken families happen. I would not want to change or trade my places mm. with the guy just to be a winner in my 20s to then be a loser for the rest of my life. Yeah, it's just, it's interesting the cultural divide between the West and the East because it's, you don't realize how long you have to work on yourself and still get really good results until you like actually see it over here. Like you think you don't have much time. Like, oh man, I'm get I'm 20, I'm getting old. You're running, running out of time. You actually have a fuck ton of time to do things. Like, you'll wake up one day and you'll still be like 24, and you'll still have plenty of time to do whatever it is you want to do. Like, you genuinely have time, and that's why like focusing on short term things is it's really hard not to try to look for short term wins. Like, it's really hard to do something for two years and have a long term outlook. Like, tell someone they have to do four years of trying to build a business before they make a million dollars and. 99% won't do it, but that's the reality, right? You have to spend one, two, three, four, five, maybe five years or more on one thing to get to the top 1% of that certain field to then be able to make a lot of money or have a lot of success in that one in that one field. I'm even realizing right now this with dating. Like, so for example, yesterday, a girl disrespected me, a girl that I really, really liked that I might have to go ahead and let go. And I was kind of like bummed. I was like, man, why'd she have to do some stupid stuff, right? Why did she have to go ahead and do that thing where now I have to go ahead and enforce my boundary and let her go? And then I started thinking, I was like, wait, you know, it's just, I just got out of a long-term relationship just a year ago and I'm just learning now exactly what it's like to date. And I, I started thinking, actually, this is the best thing that could possibly happen for me because in a long enough time horizon, I'm learning all the things that I enjoy and how to be treated and what not to be treated like so that in the future, when someone else better comes along, I know exactly how to handle it. It's just about getting these reference experiences. It's kind of like in a video game where you literally go, 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 and then you die. You don't have to go ahead and get started in the beginning. There's certain checkpoints that you saved right before you die. You could go ahead and kind of like turn off the game, turn it on, and then you're back at the save point, right? Every single time you learn exactly what works and what doesn't work, you're gaining this reference experience where you could go ahead and recollect it later on and learn from it. And I even started realizing this with my dating, right? It's like, now I know exactly what to do and what not to do the next time this happens. And it's mm. about gaining more reference experiences to get more cheat codes in life, to get more saving points and checkpoints so that you don't have to go ahead and make the same mistakes. Again, it's the exact same thing in sales. When I first got in sales, oh man, like this might be hard because they might reject me. Great. They rejected me a hundred times. They rejected me a thousand times. There's only so many ways that they could go out and reject me in sales. And then I start realizing, actually, there's patterns. Actually, when they reject me here and I say this, they then don't reject me. And then I realize all these rejections are just objections that I can handle these objections and I can still make money. The more feedback that you get from your environment, the more success that you have. And the reason why people don't have it until their 30s or 40s is they don't focus on a goal and they're not willing to actually fail to get the feedback to understand exactly how to optimize for the results. Mm. The key to success in pretty much all areas is often not even finding out what to do. It's to find out what not to do. Like if you just know what not to do in, let's say trading is a good example. The key to trading is not about how much you can make. It's about how little you can lose. Because at the end of the day, the, the chance of you winning and losing is the same. It's 50-50. Like if you could win and you could lose, it's going to be the exact same odds assuming that you haven't put any thinking into it. If you just buy at a random time, the chance you make money is 50-50. So because of this, it's not about how much you make, it's about how much you can protect. Because if you make and lose an equal sum, the only thing that, like, the only way you can fix this is by making more than you lose. And so often it's not even about, it's, and so because of this, it's not about how much, it's not about how much you can learn, it's about, it's, wait, what is it? So it's, it's not about, it's about, learning what not to do versus learning what to do because if you know how to avoid all the mistakes of the prior times you made that mistake you'll never have the losing trades and you'll only have the winning trades the same with dating it's often not even learning what to do it's like what not to do like if you just be yourself and you just know all the things you need to avoid all the mistakes and you just be yourself and never make a mistake obviously there's always mistakes but if you pretty much know all the things you shouldn't do then you'll do really well 
Like often you don't even have to add too much to your game. You just have to remove the shit parts of your game. And that could, that could already be good enough just in and of itself. Is there any other points we want to cover? Maybe like politics. Do you follow I politics? I don't, I don't know anything about politics. We'll talk about that. Do you like, okay, so who do you, like the election's coming up, right? The 2022 election. You're from America, yes? Yeah. So you don't have to vote, but you should vote. So who are you voting? Like, do you follow politics? I do not have an educated decision on what I think about politics just because I've been so out of it for a long time. Like, I think I left in like 2016. So I don't know what's going on. I just only see what's going on in the outside. And I, I'm not like really like. I'm the exact same and like for maybe even a decade I would come home from school and my parents would be watching the news and I would go on my computer and play video games which was a waste of time as well and they would sit there watching the news for four hours a night maybe watching keeping up to date with the Kardashians basically of the news and I don't think there was any return on investment on that time spent watching news because I would sit there and watch it sometimes with them as well and I'd always be thinking to myself like man, like, why do you guys watch this? It's news. Like, why do I need to spend an hour hearing all the people that died from a stabbing or from the, the guy that got robbed at the store or the lottery winner or all this bullshit? Like, it's such a waste of time. And it ties back into politics as well. Like, so many, like, so many of my friends will have a conversation about politics and I'll just sit there and I'll think like, man, the time that these guys spent learning this information about politics and about the news, they could have actually put it into something which would have help their situation a lot. Obviously, not everything in life is about, yeah, maximization. Obviously, there's some times in life where you can just enjoy yourself and talk about what you want to. But I feel like that balance between useless shit and productive shit was just way too much on the useless side. Like, I feel like you can't justify in 2022 spending four hours a day watching the news. It just, or like four hours a day learning about politics. It's such a waste of time. And at the end of the day, the biggest impact you can make in terms of the impact on the world is not going to come from your individual vote. It's going to come from the impact you make on the people around you, the money that you make and how you use that money. Because the, the, the effect of that on the world is a hundred times more than the effect of one little vote in a ballot, which is probably going to be rigged anyway, depending on the country you're in. So if you spend your time on getting rich, helping your friends and family, and you're like giving back to them, that's going to help them and everyone around you more in life have a better life than just one vote for oh, I'm going to vote for Labour it's going to make such a difference in the world they're the fucking same they're both shit they're both not doing their job like th th there's good and bad arg arguments for both sides you, there's not even a like there's not even a correct way of thinking because both sides can argue very well how that each side is bad there's no actual like right answer and this is the same with topics like abortion how can we have 7 billion people all know the concept of abortion, all talk about abortion with each other, have the greatest minds on earth all talk about abortion and the topic of what to do, and yet we still can't even come to a conclusion. Clearly, there is, if you have millions of hours of conversations and every single angle has been considered, and they still have not found some sort of conclusive decision that we can mostly agree on, clearly there's, it's a topic that's just subjective. And if a topic's subjective and there's no actual perfect way to view it, why does it matter even if you have if you spend your time putting an opinion into it? It's the same with politics. There's no like perfect, oh, Trump's better than Biden, Biden's better than Trump. 
Neither of them are better than the other one because you can't decide who's actually better. It's just about your opinion, which is fucking useless if you spend your, your time on that opinion. I think the thing that most people do when they go ahead and vote for someone to go ahead and save their lives or when they go ahead and focus on politics or religion is, or whatever is, um, I think most people don't want to do the hard work. They want somebody else to go ahead and save them. No one's going to go ahead and save you. No one's going to go ahead and fix your, fix your situation. The government's not going to make you more money. No one's going to go ahead and save you but yourself, right? And people want to go ahead and think, oh, well, if I go ahead and do this or do that, or if I follow that person, then my life is not going to change. No, it's not. They, they try then getting into all these topics and things that don't do anything. Well, what they need to go ahead and focus on is literally the most important thing, and that's what are the relationships that they have with the people that they're around, because think about this, they're going ahead and voting and doing all these things to go ahead and change the world, but yet their, their family life sucks. They're constantly fighting. They know exactly how to know how to communicate. Their, their family home structure isn't really, really that good. And what I think people need to do instead of, you know, being the saint of fixing the world is just fix yourself first and then fix your surroundings and the people around you and then focus on fixing the world. I think people focus on it backwards. Like, oh, I want to save the planet. I want to go ahead and, you know, fix everything. But then they're like, well, have you saved yourself first? Have you fixed yourself first? Mm -hmm. You're focusing on all of your time and attention on saving all of the problems around the world when the biggest problem is at your home, when the biggest problem is in the body that you live in. Why don't you go ahead and fix that first and then fix your relationships with your family and your friends Fix your relationships with your money. And once you're at that point, then fix the world. Because if you, depending on the world to fix your situation, it's not going to happen. It's going to be a long and sad and depressing life. But if you could actually gain control back of your life, instead of depending on somebody else to go ahead and fix your life for you, not only will you be able to be in a better position to make better decisions, but then you realize that you're not actually reliant on some specific thing to save you. And you gain more confidence in yourself knowing that whatever it is that you need out of life, you could get up and fix it. You could literally get up and fix it. No one's going to fix it for you. You just have to decide that you have to take responsibility for it and stop playing a victim. The reason why people want someone else to save them is because they think their life sucks, but yet they do not want to put in the time and effort to work. People want the six pack, but they don't want to go to the gym and actually work for it. People want to make a bunch of money, but they want to create it passively and never want to build a business about it. People want to go to heaven, but many few rarely would want to die to go to heaven. It just doesn't make sense. Most people need to start learning exactly that if you want something out of life, no one's going to do it but you. So you have to go out there and actually get it. And what I've realized with making YouTube content and tailoring a video to hit to get to the most amount of people, people are actually like hardwired for the lazy, fast, easy path. Like when you're creating content and you're trying to you're trying to make a video that will be viewed by the most amount of people, the most people click on it. It's always about putting things fast millionaire this year, quick money, passive money, because people are just by their very nature fucking lazy. And think about the average, like think about a person who's an environment, like one of the biggest problems I think with environmentalists, people who like tie themselves to a tree and think that's going to impact the world is that they're, by tying yourself to a tree and making that your act of like saving the world, it's viewing yourself as something so worthless that the only impact you could possibly have as a human capable of doing anything you set your mind to is tying yourself to one single tree when there's seven, there's billions of trees on the planet that could be saved. It doesn't make any sense. Like would, if you believed in yourself as a human being and you had the choice between tying yourself to one tree or building a business and building sort of some sort of reserve where you can care for animals and you can like rehabilitate animals or you can build like whatever it is environmental wise like if you believed in yourself as a human being of what you were capable of wouldn't you pick the latter like doesn't it isn't the roi on tying yourself to one tree or doing one little protest just so small and mine like minuscule i feel like people just underestimate like they, they just think everything's hard and challenging and they're not able to do anything they want fast easy results they just want to tie themselves to one tree doesn't make any sense